to get to know Mike and Debbie a little bit more, hear from you guys in a couple of different ways. We'll start out with just some general updates that are good for you guys to hear and for all of us as a church family. And then we'll, most of our time will be a Q&A, a back and forth with Michael and Debbie. Let me pray for us as we start out here and we'll get going. Father, as we sang together this morning, your faithfulness is our confidence. Your faithfulness is all that we need, and we acknowledge together this morning as a church family that you have been and that you will be faithful to us. God, it's a thrilling thing to be at this point, to have Michael and Debbie with us this weekend, to have heard Mike share so passionately from your word this morning. We believe that you're with us, God. We believe that you're leading and guiding this process with this open position and that you're leading and guiding everything here at the heart. And so we rest in that this morning. We welcome you into this space, believing that you are with us here now, just as you were with our service. And so with this time, everything that we say, would it be honoring to you? Would you move amongst us, and would you continue to lead us forward, I pray, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All righty, so let me start out with just a couple of general updates on, on what is going on within the life of the heart right now, and what is to come as we start out a new year together in 2022. I'm actually, Ethan, I think, going to let you go first. So you come on up. We want to give you just some updates on table talks, on some of our World Relief Partnership pieces that you guys have heard about, Sunday school ideas that we're continuing to bat around, and a couple other things as well. But Ethan, you go first with anything you would like to update the church family on. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so table talks. Am I in the shot? Okay. Um, table talks. That was fun, wasn't it, last time we met? Um, we're going to do that again. It's going to be a rhythm, hopefully. Um, putting it together. Our, our last talk on constructive conversations, I, we left with this gigantic piece of sticky note, whiteboard thing, pa- piece of paper that's at my house, and it has a list of all the topics we want to get to. And we realized that before we get into a conversation on those topics, that it would be helpful for us to have a conversation on what we're what you could call the interpretive process. In other words, how did you arrive at the opinion you arrived at? So that will be the focus of the next Mm. table talk, which we kind of feel like is a second stepping stone into the deep end of the pool of the conversations we want to have. So all that will be put together soon. They're incredibly casual at the Valley Cruces Conference Center, so I haven't signed a contract yet, but they know we're going to be there on the 23rd of February, and I'm really excited about that. Um, So it'll be the same format. There'll be a study session kind of talking about, about what we're going to be exploring and then a, a spiritual practice inviting you to reflect with God about those things and then obviously the event night where we're going to share that space and conversation together. So we're really excited about that because we think it'll introduce a, it's an element of storytelling we can share with one another that evening. So look forward to that. It's February the 23rd. It's a Wednesday uh, in the last Wednesday in February. And um, I guess that's a segue to the only other announcement I would want to share is about the youth group. Just a thank you to the youth group for getting so heavily involved in worship and, and helping with table talk logistics and child care and um, donning a mustache um, before their age. Um, and all the wonderful things that our, our, uh, our church family's done to rally together. I just big thanks to the youth group who continue to support us and, uh, and as we support them. So, yeah, that's, that's my update, Green. Awesome. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you for the million other things that you've been doing week in and week out over the course of this transition. Yeah. Round of applause there. So real quick, you guys know as well that we have a developing partnership and relationship with World Relief, specifically in the triad, their their high point and Winston-Salem offices. We've had a number of people here at the heart. It's getting close to around 20 now, I think, who have gone through an orientation with World Relief. And what that does is set up a team here at the heart to be on standby for home setups and a couple other pieces as refugees come into the country. Right now, that has a major focus on Afghan refugees because of everything that's going on there. But it's broader than that, too. It's, it's people who are coming in throughout the year. So there's a, a few different components to that World Relief 
Triad partnership, and I'll mention them real briefly, and then I also want to update you guys on an international component that we are developing as well through World Relief as well, but that international side. So the components that we're continuing to put together for the World Relief Triad Partnership are what I just mentioned, the standby list to, to go down. The timing of families coming into the country moves all over the place because of how many different logistics are involved. So it's a, a sort of put on a waiting list and jump when they say jump kind of thing. So that's one major component. The more people we put through orientation with World Relief, the more likely we are to cover a need when that comes up, if that makes sense. So if you don't know about that at all or you want more information, let me know. That will be a significant piece. We also want to do a fundraising awareness event on an annual basis in the fall. More details to come on that. It will have a slightly different focus each time, but a fundraising awareness component similar to what we do with, with other partnerships. There's going to be a furniture drive on an annual basis as well. Most likely we will time that with App State's move out just because that would probably give us access to a lot of the furniture that we need in that kind of a drive. So an annual furniture drive in the spring, that'll be a significant piece. And then the fourth piece is that World Relief is working to develop an ESL course that they need a ton of volunteers for when that gets put together. So I'm not entirely sure on the timing there, but would love for the heart to participate with what they're doing in that whole English as a second language training, whether that is down there or up here, however that comes together, we'll participate in that too. So lots of things happening with World Relief locally, if, if we take that, that broader context as, as our local context. On the international side, all I really want to say there is that I'm in touch with Lauren Allgood, who is the partnerships, church partnerships director for the Southeast. We've had some great conversations so far. She has sent me a ton of material that outlines how World Relief does partnership with churches. And I gotta tell you guys, after, I don't know, 10, 12 years of seeing church partnerships in a number of different ways from a number of different lenses, this is really good. The, their thoroughness, their thoughtfulness, the community-led approach, the transformational approach, it, it's really good. And there's lots of different ways that the heart could be involved in one space specific location, most likely taking one of the, the country office locations that they have and partnering specifically there in a number of different ways. So much more to come on that, but really excited that that same holistic transformative approach that we've seen on, on the, the US side of things exists internationally as well. So much more to come there. At the same time, we want to continue to invest in our local partnerships here in the high country. You've heard me say over and over, we're, we're desperate to get back into the hospitality house and to continue that week in, week out ministry there. As soon as they are able to host volunteers again, we'll jump back into that. We will have our Hope Center fundraising campaign as we always do in February coming alongside young couples who are facing an unexpected pregnancy and supporting them in a number of different ways. That will come up again in February. Really excited to do that again. And then I think I've mentioned in here before, just another piece, and then I'll move on. I get, I get kind of excited about this stuff, and I go on for too long. You guys should get know excited. That. But, but the, another connection I want to make in the high country, actually some of us within our church family already have relationships here, but with Habitat for Humanity, they're doing some really cool stuff in the high country, and we want to investigate that as well. So much more to come. Bless you. <laughs> Okay, um, I also just wanted to highlight real quick that we are continuing the conversation about what we had termed Sunday school pre-COVID somewhere. We were talking about the, the desire to gather together on a Sunday morning, probably before the service time, and, and to explore different topics together and learn together in different ways and Bible study and those pieces. Know that that conversation is still going. It's, it's so difficult to navigate COVID, right, and that you make some step, take some steps forward, and then it's like, oh, maybe not quite yet. But know that that conversation is ongoing. We recognize that need within the life of our church family. We want it to support all that's going on within our spiritual formation groups. And, and so more to come on that too, but, but that conversation is ongoing. 
And speaking of spiritual formation groups, my last thing is just to say one of the reasons that we're so excited to fill this open pastor of teaching and discipleship position is that one of the key components there is our spiritual formation groups, the, the leading and guiding of that ministry, the investment in spiritual formation group leaders. And so we're, we're really excited about all that God is going to do through those groups in 2022. And I would ask just that the, you pray for that effort. It really is the lifeblood of our community in a lot of different ways. If you're not yet engaged in a spiritual formation group and you want to hear more about that, talk to, to any of us on staff or any of the group leaders. If, if you know them, we'd love to get you plugged in. And yeah, really excited for this position to, to pour into that in a specific way as well. Okay, two other real quick things, and then we'll, we'll get to more of a, an interactive time with Mike and Debbie. Typically at our church family meetings, we give a bit of a budget update. What I want to say on that this morning is just that we are moving from a six month period where things were changing constantly and all over the place and it really was just trying to be careful with spending and, and we, we cut a lot of our budget lines and, and we operated really conservatively, but we weren't using a budget in the same way as we were before and so we've worked hard over the course of the last two, three weeks. Huge shout out to Richard Campbell. Are you in here, Richard? Thank you to Richard. He's done a ton of work with our church budget and putting that together and just framing 2022 for us. What I'm really excited to share is that though I'm not ready to give you all the specific budget lines that we're working on, what I am really excited to share is that we're putting together, based on our giving trends from the last six, eight months, we're putting together a $289,000, $290,000 budget to cover the needs of the church and the outreach that we want to engage in. And that is incredible, guys. For us to go through a season like we've gone through and still be in a place where we're talking about a $300,000 budget is awesome. So let's mm -hmm. celebrate celebrate God's goodness. Let's celebrate the, the giving on the part of you all. And, and again, thanks to Richard. So excited to share more details about our budget as we move forward. We're having a lot of conversations and this ties into the last thing that I want to say. Staffing, obviously we, we recognize that it's not only this open position, pastor of teaching and discipleship, there's other positions or other needs within the life of our church family that need to be covered. And you know, that it's always the conversation about what can be covered with volunteers, what is a full-time role, what is a part-time role. So obviously staffing is an ongoing conversation. We're aware of that. That ties directly into budget because we, we carry a real conviction that we want as much of our budget to go to direct ministry costs as possibly can be the case. And at the same time, we need to cover things well in terms of staff, part-time, full-time, whatever it might be. So pray with us along that line. We, we need discernment for sure as we shore up that budget and, and put more specifics there. But the biggest thing I want you to hear is that, that we're in a good place and that there is generosity in the life of this church that blows me away no matter what kind of season we're in and, and more to come in terms of how the budget is coming together. All right. I think that's all I have in terms of updates. So now, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Deb. So I had the privilege of driving down to Charlotte to pick these guys up, and I got two hours of some of your, your backstory and background. But for the sake of, of everyone here, I would love you guys to share just as we start out here, just a, a little bit of, of your background, where you're from and how you grew up, and then maybe, maybe in the, the telling of, of that story, maybe share just a little bit about what it is that, that drew you to apply for this position and, and to, to express interest in, in being a part of what God is doing here in the high country. Cool. I'll go first. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the quick and dirty. All right. I, I was born in Texas and relocated to Oregon when I was in fourth grade. And, um, and shortly thereafter, uh, my family landed at a church where I met her in vacation Bible school. And uh, in high school, we started dating. She dumped me once, but we, re we recovered. We recovered. Still better. And... Uh, <laughs> and at the time, I think we said it was mutual, but I was crushed. And, and then shortly after, or I guess our senior year, uh, my dad got another job in Anchorage, Alaska. So my senior year, I had to relocate there. She stayed in Oregon. Uh, we, 
I gave her a promise ring, which was like a pre-engagement ring. And, and then uh, six months after high school graduation, we got married. And that was in 2000. So we've, uh, as my wife likes to say, we've been happily married for 18 years, and, um, but married for 21. <laughs> and uh, if you've been married, you get it. The start's hard. Yeah, the, start's hard. the start is hard. Um, and we always had some form of ministry mindset um, all through high school and our dating relationship. And, and it took a long, it was a long learning process um, to, to learn what that would look like and how God had wired us. And, um, and it was a painful process. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't until the last four years that um, I really, kind of like what Nehemiah did, where I just said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take seriously what God has called me to do. And, um, and so that, that led to the, to the last church that we were in. And then when, when that was coming to a close, um, you know, my, my wife, in this serendipitous way, found the job posting for the heart. And, um, you know, it was, uh, she followed someone who shared something that Amanda had shared, and it, Debbie found her way on Amanda's Instagram page, and then on the Amanda's Instagram page, there was a job posting or an announcement, and, and she went and looked at it and, and sent it to me in a text message and said, you should, you should look at this. And so I, I did some investigation and figured out uh, who the heart is, and, and then I read the job description, and um, before that, the question was, is this a church I would want to go to? Is this a church that I would want my family to go to? And it was a resounding yes. Um, every, everything that I had seen on YouTube, um, on, the, on the live stream, on the web page, um, I even watched family meetings from like a year ago um, just to see what was going on. And, and I saw a leadership team that was, that was authentic with the church. And, and I saw a church that said, we, we exist to minister to real people in real life. And, um, and we are real people. And that was, that was just kind of the, okay, I'll check out the job description. And so I checked it out, and in reading it, you know, it, it was literally, literally like this, this overwhelming sense of, this is exactly how God has wired me. This, this is exactly what he's done in my life, and, um, and, and my passion just came alive. And, and I thought, they're probably too cool for me, and I'm not cool enough for them, but I'm going to apply anyways. And, and I was like literally surprised when Graham said, hey, we'd like to have an initial conversation with you. And I was like, all right. All right, you're real. I, I trust you. No. But it, it's, been a, it's a, been a really incredible process of openness and honesty and relationship. And that is very unusual in church. Um, hiring processes just is. So thank you. It was, it's been great. <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> I guess going back to the beginning, um, I was born and raised in Oregon. <clears throat> My parents owned property 20 miles outside of this town called Roseburg, which is maybe about the size of Boone. Um, so, you know, grew up in the woods, basically, and... Um, my, I'm, without saying too much, I guess my home life wasn't the greatest. Um, I have an alcoholic father, and, um, you know, through tre him seeking treatment was what took my family to church. Uh, so then, though he didn't continue, my mom um, continued taking us. So I was kind of raised in this dual world of, you know, home being one thing and then having Christian people in my life at church who invested in me and loved me. And I really credit um, that with myself. Like, the fact that there were people who, who saw me, um, that's what led me to God. And um, so, yeah, obviously, you know, being a teenager in the 90s, everybody was on fire for Jesus. And, and so I wanted to change the world for him and, and follow him wherever he led us. Um, and, you know, of course, as we all face the reality of life, 
um, and hardship, what it actually means to follow God <laughs> in a deep way. Um, I've certainly grown from those days, but um, yeah. So <laughs> I didn't start out thinking I was going to be a pastor's wife. Uh, there's certainly stereotypes that go along with that, I think, um, which I fit none of. <laughs> so, then you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, good. that's good. Um, but I definitely love this man, um, mm. and I believe in the way God has gifted him, and I, I see it. I like listening to him teach, too, so far. Um, so, that's, so that's a plus. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I think I'm also just trying to follow God faithfully as who he made me to be. And, um, you know, I, this is, I'm never under the lights up here speaking, so that's generally never me. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess it. You wouldn't know it, Debbie. Thank you for sharing, both of you. Let me ask you just another kind of introductory question, and, and then we have some others. And I should say, I meant to say up front that we had people from our spiritual formation groups and a couple other places submit questions to, to go back and forth with this morning. So thank you to all of those who did that. There were 40 plus questions that came in. So I've done my best to try and group those a little bit. We won't get to all of them, but we'll be able to interact with those in different ways, even over the course of the next few days and, and weeks probably. So thank you for your investment in that way. I will give just five or six minutes at the end for any burning questions that you all have if we don't get to that sort of topic area this morning. So we'll, we'll have a time for just spontaneous questions for five or six minutes at the end. But these questions that I'm going to ask come from you all as, as the church family. So thank you for, for your investment in that way. So another just quick intro question. What is something that has surprised you about Boone as you've seen it in person? And what's something that sort of fit what you expected? Uh. <laughs> I, I don't know that I came in with much expectation. Um, I've never been this far east. I, well, I guess I had Florida. We did go to Disney oh, yeah, World. We did. So, um, but that's also its own world, so it's kind yeah, of different. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, um, it, it does have similarities to, to where I grew up, I think. Um, even just driving out, we went out to John's house yesterday, so out in the, kind of in the country, I guess, um, and just seeing like, oh, this is kind of familiar to me. So yeah, um, we did spend some time downtown and there was, you know, some cool things to see there. So yeah, yeah I don't know, did I answer the question? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I've, I've been really surprised by anything, except for the, what what's, Passes a mountain. We get it. You're from the west. We understand. <laughs> Where we're from? No, I won't be pretentious about it. I can't do anything about it. But I actually prefer I prefer over here because there's more hardwood, and I like to barbecue. And so um, that's all I keep thinking. I just keep thinking like I got to get a smoker, but. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's a little presumptuous at but this But we point. have two smokers currently, so... I, I need one on a trailer. Yeah. <laughs> i got to feed everybody. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, Debbie said that I'm only allowed to ask Mike the hard questions. And these are not necessarily hard, Mike, but they're a little bit more theological in nature. So we'll, we'll direct these towards you. But... Um, Talk to us just a, a little bit about how you hold intention or, or hold together the need for, maybe need for is not the best way to say it, but the, the desire in some cases for a theological certainty versus maybe on the other end of that spectrum, more of a, a mystery and embracing the mystery of God and, and those, everything related to God. You'll, you'll find out pretty quickly if you haven't already that, that one of the pieces that make up the DNA of the heart is a, a broad spectrum of belief in different areas and, and different theological convictions, different denominational backgrounds, that kind of thing. So how do you hold together that, that spectrum of theological certainty where it's needed and, and the mystery of God? Yeah. Um 
My, my personal view is that there, there are things that we can know for certain from God's word about, about who God is. Um, but I'm also finite, so I, I don't understand the full spectrum of perspective on that. Um, and so the, the, the best approach in life is to be a learner first and, and to, to, to better understand how somebody else's perspective can, can inform my perspective. And as someone who, who wants to learn and is, is so curious, um, it's, it's very important to remember that God is a mystery. He's not someone to put in a box. And, um, and sometimes our theological statements are a way for us to categorize God so we don't have to deal with other things. And I don't think that's correct. That's not a correct use of that. Um, it's, it's more of like a baseline to help us to, to go further. And so God is continually revealing himself. And, and if, if we keep a sense of awe and wonder about who he is, and an awe and a wonder of how he has revealed himself through the same scripture to other people, um, then, then we actually can have a more robust um, view of God, which allows us to respond to him even better. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. Related to that, what, what do you think is needed within a church family, within a, a Christian community, to shepherd a theologically diverse community well? What, what components are needed there? Yeah. Um, there has to be space, first of all, for, for those things to be explored. And, um, and there has to be humility. But in, in really processing the question, the, the, my, my knee-jerk response is, is to ask a question, and that what is, the, what is it that unifies us as a body? And it's the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what unifies all believers. And, um, and there are millions of expressions of worship and, um, and, and church and, and discipleship in this world. And so to, to say, I hold the keys to how this needs to be lived out is, um, is actually placing myself above God. Um, and, and so it's, it's really important to understand the difference between our preferences um, and an actual biblical truth. You know, we, we want to make things solid that are really just preferences. And so if we, if we all are able to hold our preferences loosely and humbly say, that person is, is indwelled by the same spirit as me, um, then, then unity can happen even though there's a diversity of, of thought and approach. So we've switching gear a little bit. It's been a challenging 18 months for the heart in some different ways. Some of that we share with every church in America and maybe the world in terms of the challenges that, that the church has faced. Some of that is unique to us with, with staff, tra staff transitions and, and some other pieces. Can you share a little bit just about some more maybe challenging ministry experiences that you've walked through and, and how that has prepared you to, to step into that well with, with us or just with Christian community in general? Yeah. Um, I, w I would say that the, the most recent challenge was, was uh, something that uh, even pressed what we've been talking about, even in terms of, of humility and, and depending on the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, the, the church that, that I just finished at, we, we actually made a decision to close it down. And um, that, is, that, wasn't, that wasn't in the plan, right? And, and, and it wasn't really due to COVID. Um, it was, it boiled down to this, this realization that just because you have money in the bank and just because you can have a Sunday morning service doesn't mean you're a church. And as a pastor, it's, it's sobering to, to realize that some churches are in a, in a rehab state when they go through something difficult, right? They just, they need, they need muscle strength. They need, they need people to help them to, to learn how to walk again. 
and other churches are in a hospice situation and they just need someone to lovingly walk them to death with dignity. And that was our role. That was our role. I, I was there um, pastoring with my, with my longtime mentor of 22 years. Um, and and when, when it was finally determined that, that we believe this is the most honoring way um, for this church to end, um, there was seriously a period of grief, but there weren't questions of why. It was really more of a, this is right, this is good, this is healthy. And, um, and then the, the really beautiful part is that the, our assets, our building, um, you know, Darius, you know, he's, he's, he's nearing, he was nearing retirement anyways. He just came to me one morning and he said, I wonder if there's an underserved congregation that could use a building. And, um, and we specifically, he specifically felt like God had laid on his heart the Hispanic church. Um, and, and I said, you know, that is a really, really awesome way for the, for the legacy of our church to plant seeds for the future. And um, so we, we talked to someone who was in the know about um, the, the intercultural church situation in Salem. And, and the day before, um, the same day that Darius had that epiphany, um, a, a pastor, a Hispanic pastor had called him, or not called him, called our friend, and said, we don't know what to do, we're out of space, and we're, we're on borrowed land, we're in modular buildings, and we're, we're just busting out of the seams. And, and so when Darius the next day goes to this guy and says, is there a Hispanic congregation that could use a building? It was like a, this immediate marriage. And so um, last Sun, two Sundays ago, they had their first service in our old building. And, um, and it, it, it was just, this is yours now. And because there were finances, we were able to also give them um, operating money to continue because they'd never had that kind of expense before. And, and it wasn't a matter of us saving anybody. It was just, this is something that, um, that has God's kingdom perspective all over it. And um, so we're just, we're really blessed to be a part of that kind of a story. But on, on a personal level, it was challenging. It's not something you want on your resume. But in, in reality, I'm, I'm actually really proud of being a part of something that beautiful and what God had done there. Yeah, it's really been a privilege to hear more and more of the details of that story over the course of the last couple of months. And I guarantee it's a unique thing that a, a church that has all the financial resources it needs to still make the decision to, to hand off in that way. It's, it's, it is kingdom work, like you're saying. Let me turn a little bit now to a question about sort of church structure, I guess, and, and church governance. There were several questions along that line specifically to do with, with what kind of church leadership models you've, you've been a part of or, or that you are familiar with and, and what have you seen work really well. And then another piece there, and maybe for context, I, I don't remember how much we've talked about that before, but we don't have official membership here at the heart. It's not something that we've ever had. There's, there's pros and cons to that. It's, it's always a lively discussion, but what, what experience have you had of church membership and do you see that as, as a real need or not? Um, so yeah, church leadership and, and church membership, anything you want to share in, in that realm? Yeah, so I've, I've actually always been a part of, uh, of denominations that have been congregational. Um, you know, that means that there's, there's typically a governing board, usually called elders or leadership team, and then um, really big decisions um, that the church would vote on. Um, I, I don't, well, I don't think that's wrong. I don't think it's biblical. Like, it's, there's nothing in the Bible that says this is how to do church, right? <laughs> um, and so it's... It's something that's, that's always been a, a weird thing um, to say popular votes to determine whether or not something is God's will isn't necessarily the right thing to do, um, <laughs> right? Um, and so um, you get a lot of people who have agendas that are, that are really just trying to, to make sure that happens. And, and that's, that's not healthy, it's not beneficial. Um, so 
what, what I prefer is um, a church that understands that there is a need for leadership and that leadership is, um, works really hard at establishing and maintaining trust with people and loving them because it's not about programs, it's about people. And in doing that, in, in having open and honest dialogue about things, um, the leadership is trusted and, um, and people know that, that, that they're being cared for in the decisions that are being made. That's, that's what I prefer. Um, but the, the, what was the second part of that question? Um, it just kind of membership specifically. Oh, membership. You know, honestly, the only Rolling Hills, my most recent church, had membership um, as part of its its deal, and it didn't really seem to accomplish anything. So um, <laughs> we kind of ignored it, to be honest. Um, I think it was an important thing at one point, but church as country club, where you have an inside and an outside, uh, I think is just wrong. And if that's what membership becomes, I'm, I'm not really for it. Um, if you're talking about people who say, I want to make a commitment, that's different. Um, and, and, I, and I think that commitment looks different for, other, for everybody. Like, and so it's hard to just kind of bottle up, this is what membership looks like, and so we expect everyone to do this, this, and this. Because um, not everyone's able to do that and that and that. And are we going to be like, all right, membership, please. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. I don't want that job. Yeah, yeah I think you've, you've articulated that really well. And the, the, what, what we're after is a commitment to God and to one another. Yeah. And if membership serves that, great. And if it doesn't, yeah. yeah. Okay, I have two more. And then, like I said, if there's sort of a burning question in, in your own mind and, and we haven't gotten to, to that area, you can feel free either to yell it out and I'll repeat it for the room and for our recording, or if you want to come up and use this mic, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but think that through for the next five or six minutes or so, and we'll get to that. Mike, how would you define growth within a church context specifically? How do we get after that? How do we define and talk about growth? And then what are ways that, that you would want to get after that, depending on, on kind of how we're defining it? Yeah. I think growth actually is piggybacks on what we were talking about um, we would be after with something like membership. It, growth is really more about people um, placing more and more dependency on God and, and saying, I can take a risk in his name because who I am in him is secure. And so for, for me, growth has, has more to do with people saying, I was once broken, Christ is bringing me to wholeness, and because of who he is, now I get to, to, to be a part of bringing wholeness to others. Um, and as a, as, a, as a beautiful byproduct of that, you get more people, because more people are being transformed by the, by the person and presence of Jesus. And so growth for me has less to do with trying to trying for us to figure out how to, to be here on stage so that people like it enough to come. And it has more to do with if all of us saying, where does God want me to be and to join in his work out there? And then how do I invite those people here? Um, to me, that, that's growth. And, and every church starts with a staff-heavy um, expectation um, but, but as people grow in the Lord, um, they need to see where God has them on mission in their own lives. And, and then the church becomes a, a training ground for that and a, and a way of empowering and supporting and saying, yes, go there. Who are you taking with you? Like, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's my, my view. Um, Okay, last, kind of last one. one. One more serious, one a little bit more fun. I'm going to bring you back in, Debbie, so get ready. <laughs> Mike, that something that is, is really at the core of who we are at the heart is, is a desire 
to be a, a place of, of refuge, a place of welcoming, a place of growth and healing for people who are on the margins, as we talked about last night, mm -hmm. even that word marginalized is, is turning into a bit of a buzzword and I think people are defining it and under understanding it in different ways. But if we take it to mean people who are on the outside looking in for whatever reason that might be, it might be church trauma and woundedness, it might be brand new to faith, it might be antagonistic for different reasons, what, whatever it is, they feel like they're on the outside looking in. How do we continue to actively be a place that, that is a, a landing spot and a refuge for those people and, and continue to move forward in, in that kingdom work as, as the heart for this next season. Yeah, I, um, so I'm a, I'm a systems thinker. And so I think in terms of what, what systems do we have in place or what we need to put in place for that to be for there to be those kinds of landing spots. And so if, if we were to look at what, what the heart is right now, right, we have, we have Sunday morning, a gathering, we have spiritual formation groups, and we have table talks. And then we have these other partnerships um, for, for ongoing work and commitment and work in, with organizations and, and people's lives here. Um, and if you were to ask the question like, okay, what what purpose does Sunday morning serve? Um, is it a love God completely place? Is this a learn more about how I can love myself correctly type of a place? Or is this a sacrificially serve space, right? Um, what about spiritual formation groups? What are those for? And, and if, we, if we kind of put it through the rubric of what we're called to be as people, and we do that for everything we do, and we find that everything we do is really about us learning to love ourselves correctly, we have to rethink. Because um, if, if we're all just so focused on ourselves all the time, how are we going to sacrificially love someone who's on the margins? How are we even going to notice them? Right? And so I think it's, it's not necessarily a matter of doing different stuff. It's thinking about what we do differently and, and making sure that we say, are my eyes and ears open to those who God wants me to see and engage with? And, um, and in this space, um, can I be the person, can I be the harbinger of safety for them? Um, and I, I think that's, that's the shift. Um, the, the burden is all of ours. And so any one of those spaces can be that. But it can also be a huge roadblock to that. It could, it could be both at the same time sometimes. So, I mean, I've visited churches where nobody said anything to me. Um, I've been to churches where I was introduced and then immediately ignored because of how I talked or whatever. And so it's, it's weird. Church is a weird thing. And we have to understand that when people show up, it's weird for them. Where else do you go and sing songs to something that's invisible and hear someone talk about something really boring for 45 minutes? <laughs> like, that doesn't happen anywhere in anyone's life on purpose. That's right. And we're saying, this is awesome, come here. Right? So we have to, we have to be engaging in, in a way and, and thinking through things um, through a different rubric. You called us cool, Mike, and then you called us weird. So now I'm throwing off. All church is weird. Which, which All one? church is weird. I know. I know. I know. And weird is cool. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's probably true. Me not knowing that probably makes me less cool. All right. <laughs> so that'd be a fun one for you, and then we'll we'll open it up again just for a few minutes for anyone who has a, a specific question for Mike and Debbie. But tell us what what do you do just for fun, Debbie? What do you love to do? What brings you joy? Tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> what do I do for fun? Yeah. I really like to read, um, which is really boring and uncool. But <laughs> <laughs> not, not if you're my wife. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, oh, I'm in good company. Um, yeah. So I, I read. I like watching the Hallmark Channel sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I work as an administrative assistant for an engineering consulting firm, so I, you know, work full time. That takes up a lot of my time. Um, and I'm more of a, a detail person, so I don't know. What do I do for fun? Uh, you yeah. like camping, hiking, okay, going to the coast? Okay, there we go. I do like camping, um, hiking, although it feels like when you live in a place, like, and you go to work every day, you don't explore where you live, and so there are places that... We should probably hike yeah, like in we the should. next few weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> How about for you, Mike? I don't have fun. <laughs> no. Um, I believe I really like um, smoking meat. I do. I, it may be weird, but I just love it. And um, I like feeding people. And... Uh, and the awkwardness of, of like hoping they like it, but not wanting to be like asking for them to tell me. I just want to see like the magic on their face. But I, I like that. I really, I'm very social, so I don't want to do anything unless there's someone else involved. Um, I love playing guitar, but I hate playing guitar by myself. Uh, I love writing songs, but I hate writing songs by myself. Um, so I, I, I pretty much, if it's social, I'm, I'm game. And I'm really hoping to get a motorcycle. Yeah. But. <laughs> heard you, John. <laughs> we have the Blue Ridge Parkway. Great for motorcycle rides. Just saying, Mike. Just saying. OK. Thank you, guys. Does anybody have a question that we haven't really touched on yet this morning or, or something you'd like to share with Mike and Debbie before we close out? Yes, Mike, go ahead. A fellow Mike. Yeah, I, go for it. I think you'll be loud enough. Yeah. Um, well, I was in a church experience where I was kind of traumatized by a guy who uh, came in and all that mattered to him was pushing us towards his soteriological leaning. In, in his case, it was Calvinism. And he, he really didn't uh, care about us as people except, could I make you a Calvinist? So I'm not necessarily asking where you land on the spectrum, like Molinist here, Armenian here, Armenian Calvinist or whatever. But um, but if if one of those, it sounds like you would celebrate and honor the nuance that is celebrated and honored here at the heart. But um, uh, if if you do have a preference there, was was that something where you wanted to sort of shift us in the direction where you feel like it's healthiest for people to be at, or would you just celebrate and honor the uh, the that, that, we're at. that is an awesome question. I appreciate that question. And I Mike, will. Can you, sorry, can you just repeat the question yeah, so, for everybody and for our recording? So, um, correct me if I don't fully understand the question or say it right. Um, am I, do I have um, theological understandings that I am, um, that are actually agendas of mine that I'm going to push? on this church. And specifically um, to do with salvation. I and, think. and that one, uh, his, his, it was an example or, or, or more specifically that. Um, the sot soteriology, was that just an example or specifically? Yeah, I, I, Yeah, um, l let me just tell you my, um, <laughs> this is how I explain my soteriological view. Trust Jesus, don't worry about the rest. And, and I, I say that because um, I'm someone who, when, when there are polarizing theological perspectives, I believe that the truth is somewhere on the spectrum. And when we're unwilling to have those conversations, we miss something. And so um, I, I, it's an intentional decision of mine to actually not pick one of those extremes. Does that make sense? It's also very intentional for me to, um, to teach what we encounter in God's word versus using God's word to try and push a theological perspective. Um, because I also need to be challenged. And, and when I'm studying God's word, 
I'm in, I want to encounter God. And so one of, one of the processes I go through um, when I'm studying for a sermon is I actually ask myself, what assumptions am I making here? And the very first work I do is to challenge those assumptions. Is this actually talking about that? Or is this an assumption I'm making because of years of, of church culture? And so that's, that's a work that I'm committed to, of, of always questioning the assumptions I'm making and being willing to be proven right or wrong or realizing that it's not even there at all. So that's, that's my commitment. That's my commitment. Any others? Yeah, Deb. Sure. John. I just wanted to say, not a question for you guys, but just to tell you the prayer and effort that have been committed to by the ministry leadership team and the staff. This didn't happen overnight. Um, as a ministry leadership team, we met many, many times to ask the question, does God even want us to continue? And we've asked some hard questions. We've prayed a lot together. I've cried a lot. <laughs> um, and through this whole process, it's made me love the heart more. I feel like I have a band of brothers that um, are in this together and we, we still have some more work to do as a ministry leadership team. But I can just tell you, we have them in our home. And we had dinner together last night. I agree, Graham, what you said, what you said, Debbie, God is in this. And, um, you know, I know because I moved here from California almost 30 years ago to pastor a church that I told them yesterday, I'm looking out for them. Because I know it's a huge life-changing thing, and um, but I am very uh, proud of the ministry leadership team and the staff because we've answered some hard questions, and um, we are very excited about what the future holds for the heart and for the. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. That's really well said. I think that's a great point uh, to bring us to a close. Like I said up front, this is not the only opportunity that we'll have to, to go back and forth a little bit. There are some questions that we didn't get to that we'll, we'll get your way, Mike, in one way or the other. Again, thank you for your investment, not just in this morning in this church family meeting, but over the course of, of these weeks and months that we've all been walking through this together. To John's point, I want to say publicly, I hope I have before several times over, I want to say publicly, publicly how incredibly grateful I am for our ministry leadership team and for the countless extra hours that you all have put into shepherding our church family and leading our church family over the course of the last few months. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Mike and Debbie, again, thank you so much for being willing to come and being willing to share this morning. It's so good to, to hear from you both. John, I'd love to ask you to pray for us if you were willing to close our time. Do continue to keep this whole process and, and our church family and our future in prayer. God is with us. He goes before us and comes behind us and he hems us in. So we have nothing to fear as Mike taught us this morning. John, I'll hand over to you. Father, we're just so grateful that 
you love us when we're really unlovely, and you love us when we are on the margins. You love us when we feel like we're on top of a mountain, even if it's a small mountain, and you love us when we're in the valley or in the desert. You truly never give up on us. And we sense your presence in our midst. And we want to honor and bring you honor and glory. We ask for your guidance as we continue to move forward. It's the cry of our heart to touch and love on those who need it. And Father, I just pray for for Michael and Debbie that you would speak to their heart. And whether they ever end up in Boone or not, that they would remain strong in you and that they know no matter whether they end up here or not, that their identity is secure. And Father, we just uh, pray for your continued grace and mercy in their life and for their, their children. Um, Father, may they sense your presence as they also seek your guidance. And we love you so much, Father. And we just ask all of these things in the name of our Savior and Messiah, Jesus. Amen. of his name. 